Welcome back to Movies TV Mad. You can follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad, TikTok at Movies TV Mad, Triple X, and Instagram at Movies TV Mad Triple Five. So, welcome to Monday's edition of the Movies TV Mad Daily. And today we are going to talk explicitly about Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. So, sit down, pick up your coffee, and just chill it out and whatever you think about the conversation we're going to have today please be constructive and comment down below please and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already i remember sitting in the cinema watching batman versus superman dawn of justice for the very very first time and i remember that moment as superman tells lois that this is his world you are my world kisses her and flies off for the final time towards Doomsday. And as, uh, as Hans Zimmer's and Junkies XL's compelling music, compelling score is playing, there's a voice in my head saying, Mick, this is who Superman is. He makes that sacrifice. He puts himself last. This is who Superman is. I've heard so many people say, this isn't a Superman movie. He barely says anything, blah, 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 blah. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. What is the motivation of Lex Luthor? His hatred of Superman and jealousy of Superman having these gifts and powers and he hasn't. What is Ben Affleck's Bruce Wayne's um, motivation in the movie? Superman. He sees him as a threat. He witnessed from his perspective the Battle of Metropolis and that gave him a negative opinion and fear of what Superman is capable of. Ultimately, he decides that Superman must die. The public's motivations, all the news channels, it's all about Superman. This is Superman's story. And I don't care what anyone says, he gets so much screen time, and he gets as much screen time as Bruce Wayne and Batman. We see both perspectives here. Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, is a movie of both characters' perspectives. It's neither Batman's movie or Superman's movie. It's both of their movies. It's a movie of perspective. Now, as I came out of the cinema, I was buzzing and I thought, this is an Oscar nominee. This film is another dark night. I literally thought of that. And you lot can laugh at me as much as you want. That's how I felt. I didn't have one thought in my head of people are going to hate this movie. Sometimes you go and see a movie and you think, fucking hell, this is terrible. When I came out of The Last Jedi, I thought, I didn't hate it, I didn't like it, I was underwhelmed. And I thought, people surely are going to have issues with this movie. But then I thought, you know, Disney Shields are just going to love this film, aren't they? Because it's Disney. Um, I didn't know the kind of disdain Star Wars fans were going to have for The Last Jedi. That surprised me in a way. So I never thought when I'd start reading the reviews, because I never read the reviews before I saw the movie, because I didn't want to spoil the movie. This, this movie was huge for me. Any movie with Superman in it is the most important movie for me, let alone a Batman versus Superman movie. It was huge for me, seeing the TV spots constantly, the trailers, I thought all the marketing was wonderful. It looked wonderful. It's a shame the marketing wasn't honest about the kind of movie it was going to be, and I don't think we would have had the divisive kind of blowback we had for this movie, and we've discussed that many times. I was genuinely shocked reading the reviews, and they were mostly bad reviews for Batman vs Superman, Dawn of Justice, calling it a bad movie, and talking about the Martha moment, which we will discuss as well. And I was just stunned. But then I remember back to the reaction of Man of Steel, and I kind of saw a bias, a bias from Access Media. Hate for WB, hate for, um, um, the, for Zack Snyder, and hate for his interpretation of these two DC characters thus far. You see, the thing is, Zack Snyder isn't saying this is the only way Batman and Superman and other superheroes should be depicted. He's saying, I'm going to tell you a story. What if Batman and Superman were real? In the real world, how would people react to them? How would people react to Superman? For Christ's sake, the destruction of Man of Steel was written in by David Goyer, 
so they could do this in BVS so we could examine if Superman should be going away acting unilaterally and you know like Holly Hunter's character is talking about her concerns about Superman are the concerns that you and me would have about him in the real world but it conflicts you as well as a Superman fan because you know he's good you know he's coming from a good place but the people in the real world don't know Superman don't understand Superman so it's a wonderful kind of conceit narrative conceit so when I hear that this film is a bad narrative movie that this is bad and that's bad I never understood it this film has a great core story to it and the action is fantastic and I also never believed the CGI for Doomsday was bad in fact I thought it was outstanding I love the fact when he's first created he doesn't have the bones coming out of his back but as he's kind of he has that rebirth after they nuke him he then has the bones sticking out of him but as Snyder always said this is not the Doomsday this is a Doomsday in this story that's created by Lex Luthor so it's very different so you have two villains in this movie. You have Lex Luthor, an intelligent, manipulative villain. And you have Doomsday, this hulking creature who has no intelligence. He, he just wants to cause carnage. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's like a wild animal who's come from the wild. He's never known love or affection. He's born. He's born to kill Superman. And somehow he knows that's his job. And, and I don't get that element of it, but it's great. Although he does go for Luther as well. So it's kind of, I suppose it's kind of hinted there that this guy will just decimate anyone and anything. He's just a ferocious beast. So then we have to talk about something else. The introduction of Wonder Woman is wonderful in this movie because she doesn't say very much, like Superman, she doesn't say very much but then she's not the main beat of the film. But this is probably the best way. When we look at um, the Marvel Studios MCU, and we look at how they introduce characters in other people's movies, I don't think it was quite as good as how Snyder, um, you know, introduced Wonder Woman. I think it's brilliant because you see her around, you see her at, um, you see her at Luther Swindig when he does the speech and everything, and you know, and you know, he's talking about Zeus, and you can see the reaction in her face. You don't see much of her, but slowly but surely, with her interactions with Bruce and what's going on, we find out a bit about her. So, if you don't know anything about Wonder Woman, you learn that this woman pretty much is immortal, and she's been living well for a very, very long time. When Bruce discovers that picture, which is interlinked to which is going to be interlinked with the Wonder Woman movie. So Snyder had great in, interconnection with his story arc and his movies. There was never any reason to chuck the man away. Original. Let him do what he wants to do. Then if you don't like it, after his arc's told, if people haven't come to the table, then fine. You, do, you know, the, the next creative comes along, like they do in the comics. And he was even planning his own flashpoint. So, it was, they were nervous. There's no question they were nervous. I remember when Ben Affleck was announced as Batman. And I, f I felt really, really angry. But then I stopped myself and thought, hang on, Mick. This is an Oscar-winning director. They clearly want him to write and direct and star in a Batman movie, which actually were the plans, but I didn't know those plans. I just guesstimated it. And as you know, a lot of my guesses kind of ring true because I understand the industry and the mentality of the industry and studio execs. So that was a good idea as well. So um, I gave him a chance and I remember the first trailer for BVS and I just thought, wow, the look in this guy's eyes, he's damaged. That's what I thought. When he's looking at that Batman costume, deciding whether he should wear that, break into uh, Luther's place or go take the invitation up and go to his party. When we see that in the trailer, in the first trailer, I'm kind of thinking, this guy looks fucking hurt. It's a great performance by Affleck in that sequence. So Affleck's a great Bruce Wayne and a great Batman, but I'm not one of those authoritarian people who are going to tell you he's the best ever and no one should ever play Batman again, because that will be dumb. But he's a great Batman and he's a great Bruce Wayne. And for me, so far, 
the be best interpretation of Ben Affleck's Bruce Wayne and Batman is in Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice. And so you've got a really good older Batman, bitter Batman, and he's, he's hurting people um, because he's hurt in a way. He's unleashing his pain onto criminals. He says to Alfred, criminals are like Alfred, oh, sorry, say that again, criminals are like weeds, Alfred. You pull one up and no one grows in its place. Of course, that's very, very true. That's life, isn't it? And so doing this for so long has damaged him psychologically. Losing Dick Grayson to the Joker has damaged him psychologically. Um, there's so many great nuances and narrative story beats to this film. It's a very deep indie type of movie. And the story and the motivations, why it's Superman's movie is because it's all a knock-on effect from Man of Steel and the destruction of that movie. Some see him as a hero, some see him as a friend. One of my favourite sequences is when he goes, he, I don't know where he goes, Mexico, and he, and, and, he, and he saves that girl from that burning building, and you can hear all the media talking at the same time. And Zimmer's and X Junkie XL's music is just perfect for that moment. And I can hear people talking about my hero, who I know, I know he's there for the right reason, but as I said before, they don't know Superman. They don't understand Superman. And that's the beautiful thing that Snyder and Terrio did. They know that us as an audience know he's good, but the people, the media, the politicians, the governments around the world don't know what we know about Superman. And so we get to this Martha moment where um, Clark says, or Superman says, you're gonna let them kill Martha. So people said, why does he say Martha? Why not say Ma? Because she's not a Bruce Wayne's Batman's mother. So he's addressing her in the name. That Not that he would know her as. Maybe he's hoping he can go and find her. I don't know. But the whole point is the nuance of this started from the beginning of the film. When we see a flashback to Bruce witnessing the murder. The iconic murder of his parents. And when Jeffrey D. Morgan's um, Thomas Wayne says... That's the whole point. So when Superman says you're going to let them kill Martha, he doesn't know what's going on. What are you talking about? Why did you say that name? What do you mean kill Martha? Martha's dead. Martha's my mother. All these thoughts are going around his head. He doesn't know what's going on. And it's not till Lois comes and saves the day and said, that's his mother's name. So that fight doesn't stop because they both, both their mothers have the same name. The fighting stops because they both have mothers. He identifies Superman as a person with a life, with a girlfriend who's come all the way in a helicopter to save his life, a mother. This must be a good guy. If people are willing to stand up for him, he's got a mother. He starts to come to his senses. And that's when their friendship begins. This is not just the story of Batman and Superman. This is the story of how the introduction of these two characters happens. It's natural that they hate each other at first, but then because of this moment, they slowly but surely become friends. And in Zack Snyder's Justice League, seeing them stand there together, when the whole group stand together, when it's Superman that helps Batman up. That is such a big moment because they've gone on this journey together. It's not hatred anymore, they're brothers now. They're part of the same team. And then when Bruce saves the farm, that's another indication that they are brothers now, that they are friends now. And Snyder and Terrio did a beautiful thing with that dynamic and that relationship. So what was it the broader audience hated about the Martha moment? A lot of you will say they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. No, they didn't want to get it. They didn't want to understand it. And there lies the problem. So they mock it. I can't even remember how Captain America and um, Tony Stark and uh, Bucky stopped fighting near the third act of Captain America Civil War. I can't remember. I'm sure you will, but I don't. But I remember why and how Superman and Batman stopped fighting. And by the way, it's a nine minute fight. Some people say it's a five minute fight in BVS. Nine minutes is a long time in screen time. 
I mean, if you see them fighting for an hour constantly or for half an hour, surely it's going to get boring. But anyway, they could have fought in certain intervals, I suppose. For me, when I first saw this film, and from the moment the credits come up, the credits come up so understated, as they do in Snyder films, but Snyder always has the credits come up at the beginning of the film. In the first film, Man of Steel, because it's a Nolan movie, Nolan doesn't like credits at the beginning of his film. A bit like um, George Lucas, in a way. So that's the differences, and that's why Nolan was really running Man of Steel, and Snyder directed the movie. But it was the narrative of Nolan and Goya, that film. No question about that. And obviously, BVS and Zack Snyder's Justice League, they're his movies. They're his name on the tin. It's different. But Man of Steel is the beginning of this arc, of this franchise, the DC Extended Universe. And people went fucking nuts. Some loved it and some hated it. Now, you know, people were divided after Man of Steel, but people were really fucking divided after BVS. Why is that? Because Snyder went and did something different to the characters that people love. And people misunderstood what Snyder was doing. Snyder wasn't saying, this is how these characters should be. This is how these characters are in my vision. Someone else will come along and do something different. Eventually with these characters, this is just my take. It's okay, this is just my take. Now, you could argue that no one asked for Snyder's take, but we don't always get in forms of entertainment what we ask for. So being a diehard Superman fan since I was a little boy, I had no issue with what Snyder did with Man of Steel or what Snyder did with BVS. Why is that? Why wasn't I offended like these people were offended? Well, it's different strokes for different folks. I enjoyed the nuance. I enjoyed the narrative. I enjoyed the fact that it's Superman that saves the world in the end from Doomsday. Superman. Not Batman, not Wonder Woman, nobody else. Superman, my main hero, my favourite character in fiction, is the hero of this story. And because of this death, because of his death, the Justice League will be formed, as it is, because of his sacrifice. It is the Superman arc, Snyder's arc is the Superman arc, plain and simple. And if we talk about Lex Luthor, people say... Oh, I hate Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor. His performance reminds me of the Riddler, blah, 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 blah. I can understand that to a point. I wasn't... When I first heard of his um, casting, I had a similar reaction as I did to Ben Affleck being cast. But then I thought to myself, this is one of the great indie actors of this generation. He hasn't put a, a foot wrong. He's chosen some great scripts. The social, his performance in The Social Network is sensational. And his take of Lex is amazing. It's not the take we asked for, it's not the take we wanted, but that doesn't make it a bad take. Now, if your truth is that Batman vs Superman and Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor is a bad take, that's fair enough. That's your truth. I would never try and tear down anybody's truth. I'm speaking mine right now. So Batman vs Superman is a film about love. Hatred, rejection, acceptance. This film has it all. Wonder Woman, Diana Prince, has rejected mankind for generations. She believes they can't be helped, so she hides from them and leads her life. She doesn't get involved. But when she sees Superman's sacrifice, she's inspired to do better as well. I think they were wrong to cut off the element of her turning her back on mankind. And then Patty Jenkins did Wonder Woman 84 and there doesn't seem to be any turning back. But maybe because she's been alive for so long it could have been pre that situation. I don't know about that. Snyder knows Wonder Woman better than Patty Jenkins. Let's be absolutely clear about that and there's a few of, here, a few of you on here that won't accept that opinion. Again it's my truth not yours. I'd love Snyder to direct a Wonder Woman movie and write a Wonder Woman movie with Terry o. That would be amazing. We'll see what the future holds because I do not want Patty Jenkins touching Wonder Woman again. And the odds are she will touch it again. And that's disappointing. But that's Hollywood. These people fail at upwards, not 
downwards because it's all about DNA. Anyway, so I thought uh, we had a great Wonder Woman introduced to us, a great Lex Luthor, a great Batman, a great Superman. People complained about the CCTV footage of The Flash, Aquaman, um, Cyborg. I didn't feel that way. I felt it was a neat way to put them in there. How do you do it? How do you introduce three characters without making it repetitive? Let's say we don't have the CCTV. What do we do? Does he bump into each one of them? Does he? Does Bruce Wayne go on a mission to find them? Does he ask them to help him against Superman? That would have been an interesting thing to do. So you could have had all those characters fighting Superman from BVS. And then you couldn't have had them fighting Superman again when he comes back from the dead. Because it would have been repetitive. So you could have done that and you could have had them doing more. But it wasn't. It wasn't a Justice League movie, it was Dawn of Justice. That's why we get little CCTV footage of them. And we get a great introduction to Wonder Woman. The way they did it, the way Snyder and Terrio did it, for me was perfect. It worked for me. But there was so much complaints about this movie, there was so much hatred. But where did it all stem from? We know Snyder has got, let's just say, some people just don't like the way Snyder makes films. It, come, it stems from Watchmen. It stems from Watchmen because some comic book fans, Watchmen graphic novel fans, don't like what he did there. That's fair enough, I did, but many people don't. So nobody wanted him doing Man of Steel. And a lot of people complained about Man of Steel, complained about the destruction. I enjoyed the destruction because this is Superman in training, this is Superman Begins. He's not assertive, he doesn't know how to be Superman in Man of Steel. So what happens in that film makes sense. I think with Man of Steel, it was obvious what was going on to me. There was an agenda from the Marvel lovies, from the Disney shills, from Access Media, to hate that movie, to call it a terrible movie. And that agenda continued in BVS. The truth is, they knew that Batman vs Superman, Dawn of Justice, wasn't a terrible movie. But they had to destroy the DCEU before it got started because of their beloved Marvel. We saw all the pictures with subtext on them, you know, having Superman stand there saying, I, I destroyed the whole, the whole of Metropolis, and then you had DC fans doing the same about the first Avengers movie. So the agenda started very early. What happened to Batman versus Superman within its box office and its reaction was pre-planned by fans and access media who already started shilling Disney and the MCU. And maybe some people were paid to do that. I don't know. Because I don't know how you go and see Man of Steel and you say it's a terrible movie. Or you go and watch Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice and you don't think at least it's a visual masterpiece. But the narrative and the subtext to it is fucking beautiful when you think of what happened at the Capitol building um, after Trump lost the election. It's kind of similar, right? So I think that Batman vs Superman is cinema. I think Man of Steel is cinema. If, you know, Martin Scorsese is saying that the MCU isn't, I think Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut is cinema. Wonder Woman, number one, 2017, is cinema. Aquaman is cinema. Joker movie is cinema. In the modern era of DC live action, DC have made some of the best films ever. I mean, MCU stands and shields say all the time, best film ever. The MC, you know, MCU fans and the broader audience think the MCU is this amazing thing. When I first saw Iron Man, I thought, well, this is a good film, but what's everyone getting excited about? I suppose if you're a Marvel fan, it was exciting. Exciting to see the first awesome Marvel film ever and to see, a, you know, a franchise being built from it. And I'm happy for them. But they're not great movies, they're good movies. But, as a moviegoer, as a fan of how things look and how stories are and how characters are done, Man of Steel, Batman vs Superman, Zack Snyder's Justice League, Aquaman and Joker movie are the finest superhero films ever made. They have that gladiator element to it, they look great, the music's beautiful. They are the best ones ever made. 
Now I love Tim Burton's first two Batman films, I really do, but the Snyderverse, and let's include Aquaman in that, and I'm not going to include the Joker movie, but I'll put that in the modern DC movies that are great. Because since then, we've had Shazam, which is a great middling family movie, and I'm happy for families and children to enjoy it. But then we've had Birds of Prey, Wonder Woman 84, and James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. I think James Gunn's The Suicide Squad is a valid, great movie. I don't think it's on the level of what Snyder did, or what James Wan did, or what Todd Phillips did. They're classics. These are films that will be remembered by you and your children and your children's children. Because when Kevin Feige finally leaves or retires or, God forbid, passes away, and there's no one to replace him because there's no one else that can do what he does. Let's be absolutely clear about that. When, in the future, when I'm an old man, the next generation will be standing these films as young people stand The Godfather and The Untouchables and different classic old films like that, Chaplin's films, you know, and Laurel and Hardy. Young people admire those films because they don't have art to admire today. But guess what? Man of Steel, BVS, Zack, Snyder, Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut, Wonder Woman, Aquaman and Joker movie are works of art. For me and many of you, that's true. Works of art. The MCU has very few works of art. Now, I think that Chloe Zahu may change that narrative, but it'd be interesting. And by the way, just quickly going into that whole thing about that character who's like Superman and it looks like how Superman's eye beams work, heat vision work in the Snyderverse and people are saying it's copying and a ripoff. I don't think it's a ripoff. He's not Superman. He's nothing like Superman. Just because you've got Superman's powers, it doesn't mean you're Superman. And that's my opinion on that. And that's a silly conversation. And it's a silly, another silly, toxic debate. So those movies, those movies I've just listed, are modern day classics. And Batman versus Superman is something extremely special. What did Grace Randolph say? It's The Shining. People hated The Shining when it was first released. But finally, Ultimately today, The Shining is seen as a work of art, as it is, and the performances are fantastic. So, you don't have to like BVS. You can love these, this, you can love Free Guy. You can love these silly, meaningless films, because I don't think today's audience appreciates art. Oh, they talk about colour palettes and this and that, but they don't have a clue about art. Because if you had a clue about art, Man of Steel would have made a billion dollars globally. And, you know, Batman vs. Superman would have made two billion dollars Force Awakens money. You know, you would have appreciated these movies because they were something special. And if the air cut happened back in 2016, if he actually got to give us his film, I think I'd be saying that movie's a work of fucking art as well. Proper directors, proper artists making these films. We were so lucky. And the removal of Snyder, as much as I say I want to move on, as much as I say I'm looking forward to the multiverse strategy, the removal of Snyder was absolutely wrong. You needed people to stick to their guns because I think by the time we got to his Justice League trilogy, people would have come to the table. It's one of the biggest tragedies in films to take away a director from a vision that he had and say, do you know what? We're not going to do that. Especially when you're doing a multiverse strategy and you can have him there as well. And as I say, there's different reasons why Snyder isn't involved in this multiverse strategy, mainly because the studio feel they can't work with him. And that's a different conversation we've had many times. Today's not a day for me to be negative about Zack Snyder. It's to ooze and celebrate what the man achieved with his free movies. But it goes beyond his free movies because it goes to Wonder Woman 2017 and it goes to Aquaman as well. Who are all, the old classic works of art as far as I'm concerned. And losing that was a great tragedy because these films remind me of films like The Ten Commandments, you know, starring Yul Bremner and Charlton Heston. 
you know, we're talking about four or five hour movies. These were fucking epic. Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut is around four hours long and epic. We deserved, Snyder deserved to see the climax of his art. I would say to David Zaslav, I would say to Discovery, please allow Zack to finish up. Please release the air cut. Please allow all this to take place on HBO Max and please, for fuck's sake, let me and my international and global brothers and sisters, or however they identify as, have access to your HBO Max, because this is ridiculous that people like me don't have access to HBO Max. It's not fair. So eight years today since Ben Affleck was announced as Batman, and I can't wait to see him in the Flash movie. Now, finally, Scott Edwards, I think, has um, asked me a question. He keeps on asking me this question. Um, he is super fan Scott Edwards, as I refer to him. Scott, I have kind of um, answered that question before. The question I'll repeat again, if I haven't said it already. Basically, he wants to know the future of Melissa Benoist, Supergirl, in the DCEU, in the DC live action universe. Because we know this is the final season being aired this Tuesday and every Tuesday over on the CW. I believe within the multiverse strategy, Scott, there is a place for everyone. And I believe maybe Melissa will get her opportunity in the Flash movie as well. Because Andy and Barbara have already told us that there's many, many DC characters and multiversal crossovers in this movie. If you remember back to DC fandom, they were talking about what they would like as a multiversal crossover. Ezra Miller saying, He'd like to see Nick Cage, not as his Superman, but just as Nick Cage. Personally, Ezra, I disagree. I'd rather see Nick as Superman in that film. We'd just have to wait and see. But having Nick Cage in your movie is epic and awesome. He's one of the great actors of our time, of course. So that's my answer to that, Scott. As you all know, I'm an all-round fan of DC. That's why it hurts me when some of you on social media start putting down some DC films to lift up others. Let's celebrate them all. Even if you don't like Arrowverse, celebrate that there's people out there that love Arrowverse. Even if you don't like Smallville, which I adore, maybe my favorite live action inter interpretation of DC ever. If you don't like Smallville, allow people to enjoy Smallville. And just ignore them if you don't like it. Don't stamp on people's hearts because they love something that you don't. If you don't love the Snyderverse, then allow the people who love it to love it. This is what happened. Everyone was, you know, stamping on people's love for the Snyderverse from Batman vs Superman and Man of Steel. And this is why the Snyder fans went on the attack to other versions of DC content. But it's not right when they do it, and it's not right when others do it who don't like that stuff. We need to learn to be better. This has been the Movies TV Mad Daily. I'm Mick, your host with the most. Just ask your girlfriends and your wives. And I'll see you again in the next video. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter, at Movies TV Mad. TikTok, at Movies TV Mad Triple X. And Instagram, at Movies TV Mad Triple Five. I have socials, beyond socials, beyond socials. And I'll see you again in the next video. And don't forget to tap that little notification bell if you don't want to miss this perfection. See you again soon.